idea where the bloody hell's at. Get off, get <laughs> um, Look, there's a lot going on here. There's a lot going on for Harry Houdini's bench. Let's look at this bloody pile, right? Now, these are all kits. I can hardly bloody see. I'm going to get a sore neck on this. Uh, all of these kits are currently on my bench. These are kits that I'm working on, right? There's a Panther here. There's a Char 2C. There's a bloody um, Dornia Arrow. And um, the Skoda just needs finishing off. And BD7, I've got a few things like that. I started on that spinny, didn't get very far with it. There's this kitten crap thing, a uh, um, kitten grab. <laughs> That's a beauty. That's that little motorcycle with tracks, you know. There's the um, lovely little... Um, Daimler Benz there that I picked up free and uh, that's nearly finished. I'm going to do a video on that because you asked for it. I will show you all the tricks because I'm building belts for the bloody um, drivetrain and all kinds of little things that I'm customising and building for that. That's coming up. And then, oh, at the top here I've got the bloody Arisani as well. Poor old Boris and Karloff. Still got bloody uh, toothpicks up their bums while I paint them. Oh dear, they're not happy about that. Anyhow, enough of that. Oh, get that out of the way. Now, some time ago, um, on um, Roy Rivett's Facebook page, a fine modeling, right? Nice bunch of guys. Roy's a lovely guy. And I um, I purchased this. And Roy's a big fan of World War I tanks. And he went, oh, that looks good. Yeah, we've got to build that. We've got to build that. And then he bought one. And a number of the other guys bought one. Rolfie bought one. And a whole bunch of you guys have all bought the little French FT-17. And announced, it's Harry Houdini's buddy build or something like that. Or I'm responsible anyway. So bloody hell, uh, I might have a dozen kits over there built, but apparently there's a buddy build going on and it's my bloody fault. So I'm going to pull my little digit out of the ass and um, get on with this. So um, let's make a start and see what this uh, men kit is all about. Okay, here's the kit and I'm not going to go into great detail with an unboxing because a lot of the other guys have already done that and there's heaps of clips on BoobTube so um, we'll just sort of do a Harry Houdini have a look now box art's great, you've all seen that, it's really nice one of the problems that I have and a number of other guys have is once you pull the parts out sort of have a look at them and then you try and put everything back in the box it just bloody explodes there's just so much stuff in here um, right now you do get, what I do like is you get this beautiful book right this book is just lovely and um, everything in it is so nicely laid out and it's so easy to follow and I, I've already started on another men kit the Char 2C and that was just a dream to put together video of that out another time but look at this you get these lovely colour um, pictures you get the colour call outs there next to the drawing not like most of these bloody things like Dragon a few others we got a six pages back tells you what the colours are and you've got to flip forward and try to figure out none of that bullshit it's all there you can see exactly there's brown there's cream there's green bingo bongo all right so it is a lovely set of instructions all right very easy to follow and you get a bit of history at the beginning um look i can't say enough about meng everything i've seen of theirs so far and i've got about four kits um, that are meng they're all beautiful um you know they're well worth the money in fact i didn't pay much for this only about four shekels and that's the thing to watch out for this one doesn't have the interior. Well, it's just got a little interior for the turret, right? And it's the um, the square riveted one. There's the one with the round turret, the cast turret. That's got full interior and everything. Now, that one can sell here for up to about eight shekels, right? And then they try and palm off this one at the same price. No, 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 no. Don't let the bastards rip you off. No. This one um, has a, um, a little diorama. doesn't have the interior. You should get it for half the price of the one with the round turret. So just watch out for that. If you've paid eight shekels for this... Take it back. Tell them they're dreaming. Okay, now, um, parts, parts, parts. Well, everything I've already cut into the bag, so we can have a look at it. Um, these are just wheels and wheels and wheels and wheels and wheels. And um, and these are rather lovely. You've got some decals. I won't go into those, but they're, they're kind of nice. May not use them, because I'm really going to find an unusual version, and that's how I'm going to paint mine. I'm going to paint an insignia mine, something different. Australian, if I can. Um, you do get your little token bit of photo etch, and I haven't yet used Ming's photo etch, so we shall see. But it doesn't look too bad. It's, um, you know, at least it's the yellow stuff, not that god-awful silver stuff. All right. Now, this sprue is um, your diorama, if you want to use it. And, um, you know, it comes with a few things, a sax and a stand, this and that. Well, we'll, we'll see. Um, we may, may just build it for the hell of it and see what it's all about. But, um, you know, um, if you're going to do a diorama, you probably want to do your own thing. Yeah, we'll have a look at that later. Now, lots of little fiddly parts, and they're all gorgeous. So these two sprues here, this is sprue C. Just look at the detail there. 
Look at the rivets, Roy. <laughs> yes, look at all the rivets on that. And, um, you know, it is Ming. It is lovely. Look, there you are again. Look at this lovely wheel, right? See if we can get that ultra sharp focus. There we go. Sorry if I wobble. Right, don't know why. I have to talk quietly so I don't wobble. <laughs> Isn't it? My, my wobbliness is directly proportional to how loud I talk. Oh dear. Um, so, you know, you get little tiny little things. Everything's beautiful. Look at that. There's, there's no flash. There's, there's no rubbish. It is a beautifully uh, moulded kit. You know, you can't... Everything of Mang that I've seen so far is just top rate. Um, their prices have gone up, which is a bit annoying. And maybe that was the trick that they suckered us all in with the prices that were reasonable and said, right, now we've got you. Now you know how nice our kits are. Well, here, shove this up your bum. <laughs> I hope not. I hope it's just a currency exchange thing because they have gone up a considerable amount lately here, at least, down under in the Antipodes. Now, um, oh yeah, didn't fully break that one. Okay, the bag's broken. Um, more parts, more parts, more parts. Look at this. Um, there's, there's something that's quite nice. Look at that. That's, you know, that's the size of my thumb. See, there's my thumb. I got little hands. So it's probably about the size of your tip of your index, so your, your little finger. Um, but there you go. That's um, that's looking pretty bloody good. So moving right along, this is what we'll probably get into today. We'll try and get the um, base of the body built up, which doesn't seem to be that hard. Then we'll give it a lick of paint inside, give it um, give it its inside colours. Um, lots of rivets, lots of rivets. Oh, it's a joy. You know, one, two, three, four, five. <laughs> you know how much. Now look at that. This is the interior of um, inside there. Even though you don't get a motor and all that, look, you still get... That's probably hungover from the kit. Hungover? Hangover. It's a hangover. I don't think it's hungover. Wouldn't be pissed, would it? <laughs> Too early in the morning to be pissed. Um, right, anyhow, look at this. this is... Um, I'm waffling, I know. Again, look here, the sides. We'll try and get into those today. And look at the rivet detail there. Hey, eh? Beautiful. This kit should look bloody nice with just a little bit of a pin wash and, and I'm not going to put a lot of mud on mine, I reckon there's so much nice detail on this I don't want to muddy it up too much, I really don't but it's um, it's quite beautiful, now this looks like more of um, the diorama by the looks of things, yeah there's there's bits of diorama there, there's a there's a big plastic turd <laughs> and these are like walls and sides, there's some things there, I, I might see what we can do to um, use it but maybe do it differently hey eh? so we make it my own and then this is the fun bit these oops sorry about that these are the non gluable or you don't need to glue them track links so we might make a start on those first because I am fascinated to see if these will actually do what they say and click together and um, and run and here we have it I've had a bit of a play and these little track links go together like duck nuts. <laughs> I don't know how duck nuts go together, but anyhow, they're really easy, okay? Um, they just snap together. That took me like two minutes. It took me longer to cut those uh, wheels off the sprues because I wanted to see how they'd fit and um, pop them in. But they are, look, they're just, they're all wobbly, see? They do work. Now, I used um, a technique that I had found worked best for doing um, indie track links or workable ones when I had the Bronco track links for the BD7 because I found if you went one way they snapped one way they fitted together perfectly so let me see if I can elucidate you as to what I did now one thing you have to watch out for is let's see if you can uh, if we can get a focus thing happening can you see it's got a nipple do you see that right. yeah there's a um, there, there's a little mould um, injection mark or whatever there, and they just come off. Now you will need to get those off, especially for my method, and yeah, you need to get them off anyway. Whether you will need to sand all the uh, links to get rid of that little bump, I don't know, we'll see how it is when we put it all together. But, here's the method that I used to some great extent and success when I did my little BD7. Now, put a link down on something hard. In my case, it's going to be the, um, the cutting mat. Get your next link right lined up. Hold your first link down so that you're absolutely sure that that edge is flat, not tilted up, and then slide that one in. Now that might just seem rather obvious, but I tell you what, I have learnt in the past that if you hold them in the air and try to put them together, you'll snap off the tiny little pins. If you try and have one down there and you place the other one on top like you would do with magic tracks, 
you'll break the little pins. At least that's what happened to me um, with um, those Bronco track links and they were like this, tiny little, like you won't even see. I doubt we can focus. Oh look, can you even see them? There is pins there the size of gnat sticks. They're tiny, right? You can't see them. It's not even worth, not even worth me doing that bit on the video. Just ignore that bit, edit it out of your mind, there's no point. But look, um, basically, if you do it this way, okay, so line them up, make sure that one's correct, nice and flat, click. Okay, and you shouldn't have any snappage. At least I didn't seem to break a single one. Whoop, there's one. Now look, I've lost one on the floor. That's okay. 32 links aside, but you get about half a dozen spare in the kit. So uh, even if you're a fumbling fingers like Harry Houdini and lose half the bastards on the floor, well, not a problem. Um, so, oh, this one's not quite boring. What am I doing wrong? Oh, it's just me. It's just camera. Camera problem. Now, look, I'll, I'll keep going because these really don't take that long. Because as you can see, while I'm talking to you and prattling on and farting and knocking things on the floor, there's nearly half a dozen. Um, as you can see, I'm quite, finding quite a few of these this time with that little um, that little nipple there, right? And it just comes off with your fingernail. Um, you can use the knife if you're a, you know, you're a decent problem. Look, there's half a dozen done. All right, let's spread this up. Let's um, put those together, and then that's all my track links done. I feel like I've actually accomplished something. Thirty-two links in three minutes. <laughs> it got to be the easiest track links in the world, and then. Of course, you don't have to wait for them to cement or dry, or you don't have to worry about wrapping around the wheels and getting sagged because these are already saggy. Now, the last two, right, I'm going to put those together. What I would recommend is turn it over. I don't know if you can see this on camera, right? Turn it over so that you've got those last two sitting flat on the um, flat on your board, and then it's just a matter of repeating the same process and sliding them in. Now, I did have one snap. I actually did have one snap. Um, this one I clicked in and mustn't have been right or it could have been a bit weak and the pin snapped straight away I could tell one side hadn't got in. So thank goodness there's half a dozen spare and I even found that one on the floor. So there you are, so that's it and um, so I've already cut out a couple of these wheels now. Seems to be a spare wheel here, that wheel must be an option for something else because then it looks like this is the front and this is the rear one. That's the sprockety one, the drive and this must be the, you know, the basic of the front return roller I suppose. I suppose that's how it works. So um, yeah, they fit in there nicely and um, that's how easy it is to do the track links on this FT-17. Well, I better start um, getting on with the body. One of the things that um, I always do is keep these containers that dips and things come in because they end up being wonderful to um, put your parts in as you build and you won't lose them, right? Because then I can keep that, sometimes I can keep it in the box or there's not a, not a lot of room in this box, but I can keep it nearby and every kit that I build, you know, because you've seen the 12 on my bench, I get interrupted and oh god, you know, I don't want to lose a part. So as I build and make up sub-assemblies and things like that, I'll um, put them into here or I'll even bag them and seal them up and put them back in the box. That way things don't get lost. So I can come back in a year's time and go, well, where was I up to? <laughs> all right. Now, here's something. Now, always, well, I always have a look at the instructions and I won't always do exactly what they say. I have a look and make up my own mind. If you see any of my videos, you know, it doesn't always work, but usually it does. Now, one thing here is this interior, right, has got to be one colour. Now, if I go and do what they say here, you've got this part is white, but these are all different colours here. This is white. This whole sub is a different colour. Um, that's why these are different. And then you get to your side walls. Um, they're white. That part's white. Um, part three is the outside. Uh, that's the inside, but basically that's white, and those are just little bits you could fit later. That's the outside. Um, that's the top. You don't really get to put that, um, that whole interior together until step seven, right? But there's no reason why, as far as I can see, I couldn't do that now and leave this bit out. Now, these are all white on the inside, right? This thing here is where all the coloured bits are, and that's the sub-assembly. Okay? That's this thing here, right? And then it gets um, it gets little extra bits added to it there. That could be made up and put aside, in, in my view. So that, to me, that's the sub-assembly, this part B30. So I'll leave that and I'll do that later. All right, but what I can do, I believe, is there's nothing stopping me today 
um, to basically build up the sides and the bottom and assemble that all together and even the back piece on. We might even get this little front plate on so I can't see how that's going to stop um, that, that from sliding in. Might even be able to get this little B12 on, we'll see. I'll, I'll cut this part out and I'll see if it, um, if it would slide in easily. Um, now you've, you need some experience to be able to do this and a lot of confidence and you know a lot of arsery. <laughs> Harry Houdini's, well let's just do it. But I reckon I could do that. Now the reason I would do this is I could then have that all together and then I can just spray paint in one go all those parts and do the entire interior and I could even then run a wash and weather it. And it's all ready for me adding those other parts which I would basically do individually anyway. Like with all my tools and everything like that, I, I don't um, put them on the vehicle and then paint them, no. You know, it's like this this one here. I'll, I'll cut him out and get him all ready, um, but I'll paint him up. And same with a lot of things. I might paint them up off the vehicle. The reason is I am so wobbly that if I try and paint something like that, when it's in situ, I'll probably splash paint all over the bloody place. Or I'll have to mask it all up, which I absolutely detest, and try and paint it with a mask. Well, I don't need to do that. If I build up a sub-assembly and leave all the ancillaries off, I can paint that, paint all my bits and pieces separately, um, I can always scratch a little paint off where the mounting points are, glue them back together, and bingo bongo, the whole thing gets done easily and it's painted perfectly. This is Harry's Houdini's way of arsing it together. Alright, so that's what I'm going to do now, is I'm going to cut those side pieces out, put them together and get ready for a lick of the interior paint. Now that's gone reasonably well, and you'll notice I've been using my fabulous new um, shear cutters here. They're incredible. You can do something you normally wouldn't do, which is, um, say you want to remove this, you'd normally put, cut quite away from the um, from the plastic, right? Well, don't do this at home, kiddies. I can do that, and it doesn't distort or damage the part. But you may not have these wonderfully. These are very special. Um, Mini Shima uh, micro, uh, well they're not micro cutters, they're shear cutters and the blades on them are incredibly sharp and they cut so fine that they are the duck's nuts. Anyhow, I digress. Um, parts cut out it reasonably easily, not a real problem. The um, bottom part here, the edges are all beveled so all the sprue points on there easily, well with my thing I've cut up pretty close anyway, you probably need to trim with a knife and then you can just file it a at a beveled angle, All right away you go. Now be very careful with this plastic. This stuff is soft. It's like bloody butter. You can you put a dent in this shit so fast. Um, just be careful. Just take it nice and easy. Because even that's my worn out um, nail file. That's a smooth end. Oh, I wasn't even going to use my new one, which I've I probably don't use this anymore because it's so worn out. But this was chomping through it because um, you know I felt how soft it was. So there's no way I put my new file on there. I probably Half the thing will be gone. Yeah, um, one little issue, and I'll show you over here. Uh, maybe we can get up nice and close, and so you can see see the problem. Um, let's see if we can focus. Okay, now there's a sprue point. That's as close as I cut. In fact, on this side, yeah, that's how close that those micro cutters cut. And notice that doesn't really distort. They are incredible. Don't try that with yours unless you've got them with a shear. Now this is not a bevel. Well, it's probably going to be a bit hard to see. There you go. Can you see it as a lip with a cutout? Okay. So that clicks in there um, to the bottom on the bevel. Now usually with these kits you get bevels to bevels. Right, so filing's really easy. You'd, um, just like I did with that bottom part, you'd, um, you know, work out which way your bevel's got to go. It's got to go inward. And you'd do that, right? And that's what you do. Well, that's not going to bloody work here. This um, this little sprue gate, all right, you're going to have to get the knife in there and cut a little bit in, but not too far because you don't want to rip the top. And then you're going to have to basically um, cut in that way. So you're going to have to actually chisel in and chisel around. So there's that little bit of sprue that's left in there, right? And there's no way that you're going to be able to actually file that out and get it to do what you want it to do. So what I'm going to have to do is and this has also got so much bumpiness on the outside is um, and this is another good reason to not glue all the little bits on and then find well I want to assemble it, I've got all these things away, you really got to prepare your parts so what I need to do is I have to actually score along that trench line 
very carefully because if I go too far I'll wreck it, I'll go through All right, so just score along that little trench line there so you don't want to push too hard because you'll slip and cut your bloody arms off very carefully cut that out Oh, it's only a tiny bit, it'll fall out. So that's just about there, that's just about cut out. And then you'll need a nice little diamond file with a square edge. This one's got quite a, quite a square edge on it. You'll need this little diamond file and you'll have to very carefully get in there and remove the, um, any of the rough bits. All right, so that is how you do it. They are fiddly, right? And I've done a lot of them in my time and they are something I don't like. I think it's personally, I think it's bad engineering. Um, if you're going to have little lips like that, then put your bloody sprue point somewhere else, right? See, there's one there I'm going to have to cut off. But that one's not so bad. That one's got a nice flat edge, all right? So with that one, it's, it's a piece of cake. It's usual we can do this. So get in with my lovely little micro cutters. And I said you will not be able to do this unless you've got the same tools as me. My micro cutters practically cut the part exactly where I want it to be. And then very carefully file, because as I said, if you are too wobbly, you will chomp right through this stuff. It's so soft. But that one is pretty flat. Well, you can see the, the profile on it. Well, you can't see it. I can see it. I don't know what the bloody hell you can see. All right, so that one was easy. Huh? That's how they should be <laughs> in my book. They should be that easy. And that's where they should put the sprue gates. So like there's one here that's basically on a nice little square thing. So that one's going to be easy to do. But putting bloody sprue gates on... Um, little L cutout gutters. No, Mr. Meng. Well, that's um, that's that's your first failure in my book. That is not a good technique. They are an absolute bitch to cut out. Anyhow, enough complaining, enough whinging. I'll get on and get this done, and then um, we'll glue it together. Each part I I've tested. I like dry fitted it, see if there were any gaps, and then I filed a little bit more and adjusted until I've got it how I want. Now there, there's some injection sort of marks here on the inside but I don't think we're going to worry about them because that's the rear which is all going to get covered up because we don't have the motor because this one doesn't come with all that full interior the only thing we've got is this little driver's area here um, which this is the part that I cut out to test and that um, that slots in and fits nicely there I'm not going to have a problem putting that in afterwards at least I don't think so and because I know that's a different colour and I know that the pedals are different colours and various of the ancillaries going here I'm going to do those all separately, build them up as sub-assemblies, paint them, put it in. All right, all that's left to do is glue this together. All right, now I put those sides on with the um, contactor, and there's a good reason for that. This allows me to have fettling time quite a while as I need to adjust things. Now I'm switching now to the Tamiya Thin because this little end piece here, I'm going to have to glue it from the outside to get it to fit. So this is where that bit of fettling with those other pieces is going to help me. So I've already anchored it correctly where it should sit there and this allows me to fettle that into place. I get this piece in here because that's going to have to sit on there. All right, and now that that's fettled into place, this is where Tamiya Thin is brilliant. I can paint the Tamiya Thin on the outside, push the parts together, and they're cemented. All right, well, I've still got time to double check and play with those. Now, for me, in my climate, Tamiya Thin sets really quickly. And usually you don't get much play with it. See, it's set already. I can't even adjust that now. I don't need to. It's pretty well right. Oh, there's a tiny bit of play in it. But basically, Tamiya Thin for me sets straight away. And so I can just put it on. Plus, you can put it on the outside and capillary action, it goes through. Whereas the um, contactor is really good to, to put on the inside of a seam when you've got it open. And then it... Um, it gets tacky, you know, you saw me, I put it on, I left it on there for probably about 30 seconds, this is the contactor, and then I started pushing the parts together to see if they would fit. 
So it's two different techniques. The, um, the Tamiya Thin is excellent for coming in the outside and when I know that I've just got to put it in there and I want to set straight away, whereas the um, contactor, I want a bit more fettling time. This part that we're worried about, which has got to go, you know, which they said put in first, but I'm going to put it in later. Uh, it's not really a problem there. Uh, uh, I haven't got it straight, but you see what I'm getting at. It's not really a problem. That's just going to go in there. In fact, that's probably not a bad thing to put in there now while it cements so that it knows the shape that it should be because the contactor um, allows you to bend a little bit. So that's all complete. So we have basic the whole. I won't put that piece on because I'm concerned about painting and also that the these um, these I'm going to have open. These are um, these are going to be little little um, um, basically doors that we have the option to have open. So I'm going to do that. That does look like it goes in place, but with everything else that's going on here, I'm going to leave that there for now so that can all cement up nice and straight. And then when my eyes um, can concentrate on this model without having a big iPad in the way, I'll um, take this part and put it on. Now that part's got some interior detail too, so that's sort of what concerns me. So, yeah, that will fit there nicely. But I'm not going to attempt that tonight. There's a point where I'll say, no, stop Harry Houdini. Let that cement and come back to it. And then I'll um, go off camera now and just go around all the edges, make sure I've got everything spot on. I think I have. I think I've got this sort of together. And, um, yeah. All right, well, there you go. That's the FT-17. I've waffled on for far too long. There's probably videos just going on forever. But um, we had a look at the kit. We've built the basic carcass. That's looking good. Then I'll get some painting and get all the little ancillaries and bits and pieces on next time. And you'll see the uh, method to my madness of going this way rather than following instructions. Or it'll be an almighty cock up. <laughs> Either way, it'll be entertaining. So there you go. That's enough for now. So that's goodbye from Australia and it's hooroo from Harry Houdini. Mm -hmm.